put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Have you ever broken a heart and had to leave? Does God care about people who do things like this? You're going to listen to the story of Moses. It happened to him. It must have been a very sad experience for Hatshepsut when her foster son Moses had to flee. From now on, she had to manage the Egyptian throne without the assistance of Moses. From the year 1488, all correspondence concerning Hatshepsut ceased. This was two years after Moses fled to Midian, which is another name for Sinai. I was curious about this strange phenomenon and started to do some research. Now, The first queen of the 18th dynasty, Amoses Nefertari, adopted the title Wife of the God Amun. When Hatshepsut came to the throne in 1504 BC, she did not accept the title Wife of God but rejected it. Question. Did she accept the Hebrew religion of monotheism through Moses? Is this the reason why all correspondence concerning her ceased in 1488? Amenhotep III started Atenism, a monotheistic religion. His wife Tai also rejected this title, Wife of God. This is an indication that she too became a monotheist. You're looking at the bust of Nefertiti in Berlin. She and her husband both became monotheists. Guess what? She also refused the title Wife of the God Amun. I would like to think that Moses influenced Hatshepsut to become sympathetic towards the monotheistic religion of the Hebrews. I bring honor to these ancient Egyptian rulers. They had the courage to abandon their polytheistic religion in favor of the pure religion where an unseen creator God was worshipped. Hatshepsut was killed in 1482 BC. Why? One of the main reasons for doing it was religious. If you change your religion, you sign your death warrant. While Moses was spending the next 40 years of his life in Midian, the Sinai Peninsula, he received bad news. His dear foster mother, Hatshepsut, was murdered. Exodus 2.23 During that long period, the king of Egypt died. Every time I visit Sinai Desert, I think of Moses. I wonder how he reacted to the news that his mother died. Fond and sad memories came to his mind as he reviewed the first 40 years of his life in Egypt. Was he aware of the fact that Hatshepsut may have been killed because of her faith in Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews? Looking at the tomb of the cruel Tutmosis III, who was now the sole ruler in Egypt, the following verses came to my mind, Exodus 2, verse 23 to 25. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abram, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. I appreciate this verse. God hears our prayers when we are in distress. He's concerned about our plight. Every time I ascend Mount Sinai, I think of the most sublime poem known in ancient literature. Moses had his suffering people in mind when he wrote this prayer. Psalms 19 verse 13 Have compassion on your servants. He was thinking of his suffering brothers in Egypt. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Moses was looking forward to the morning of the deliverance of his people from the cruel night of Egyptian bondage. But he also looked forward to another morning when tears and pain will be no more. My friend, you cannot afford to miss the next episode in the life of Moses. 
There are tremendous messages of hope that God wants us to internalize. If you've made a mess in life, don't despair. God has a plan for people messing up their lives. Don't miss the next episode on the life of Moses and see how God treats sinners like you and me. God bless. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece and discover the whole truth. Now we're going to talk about the important issue of the mark of the beast and the number of his name. What is meant with this terminology? You will remember that we dealt with the two beasts of Revelation chapter 13 and that we identified the second beast as the United States of America that would implement, according to the scriptures, the mark of the beast. And I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, the lamb-like principles, and he spoke like a dragon, Revelation 13, 11. Now we've dealt with this in an entire lecture. It exercises all the authority of the first beast, which we identified as Catholicism, before him and causes the earth and those dwelling in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, Revelation 13, 12. And we dealt with this issue as well where we explained that to worship the first beast is to pay it homage in the place of God. So the first beast has a morality and a system of morality and law which will become the norm in the world enforced by the second beast, the United States of America. And he causes, the second beast, all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name, Revelation 13, 16 to 17. So the second beast will enforce the mark of the beast and you will not be able to buy or sell if you do not partake in this practice of accepting the mark of the beast. So what are these issues all about? What is the beast's number? What is his name? What is his mark? Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6, Revelation 13, 8. So it is the number of a political system. It is the number of a man, and his number is 666. And of course, we had all the attributes of the beast in Revelation chapter 13, which were the same attributes as the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7 that we identified as the papal system, and all the reformers had the same identification. What are the letters transcribed in the Pope's crown? This comes from our Sunday visitor in 1915. This was the Jesuit mouthpiece of the Roman Catholic Church, and they themselves tell what they believe this to be. What are the letters inscribed in the Pope's crown, and what do they signify, if anything? The letters inscribed in the Pope's mitre are these, Vicarius Fili Dei, which is the Latin for the Vicar of the Son of God. Now there are some today who deny that these inscriptions actually exist. But twice in the Sunday Visitor, these theologians affirmed the existence of this title, Vicarius Fili Dei, and they should know, since they belong to that fraternity. So, Vicarius Fili Dei, what does it mean? It means Vicar of Christ, in the place of Jesus Christ. And why do we talk about this in terms of the number? Well, in the Latin, each letter has a numerical value. And if we add up the numerical value of the name, then we come to a startling conclusion. The V is 5, the I is 1, the C is 100, etc. And if we add them all up according to that numerical value, 
then we find that vicarius filiae dei will add up to 112 plus 53 plus 501 and the total is 666 so the number of his name the numerical value of his name is 666 the beast also has a number if we take the greek titles which also have numerical values the greek letters have a numerical value and then we find that the official titles of this system the latin kingdom the italian church uh, the latin speaking man helatina basileia italia ecclesia and latinos each of them also add up to 666 so I know that the term 666 also adds up to other individuals in the course of history, but do those individuals fit the criteria of the little horn and the beast power? No, they don't. So they have to apply to that particular power, and here we see that they do fit. Now, in contrast to the mark of the beast, we must also have a mark of God. Now, we've dealt with this in the past, so we'll just recap it. Understanding the mark or the sign of God. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Remember, the mark of the beast had to be in the hand or in the forehead and now we're looking at the contrast God's side what has to be in the forehead and in the hand in terms of the mark of God we discussed the seal that authenticates a document the president United States seal it authenticates a law when it is given. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths that they might be a sign between me and them that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Ezekiel 20, 12. Here we have another seal, a seal of God, which applies, applies to the Sabbath. And the Sabbath is the sign that he is the one who has authority in our lives. So God also has a sign. God's seal contains his name, his title, his territory, just as any secular ruler's seal also has to contain. And we find it in the heart of God's law. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And then it tells you that you should not work or do this and that and the other. For in six days the Lord, name, Yahweh, made, title, creator, heaven, earth, sea, all that in them is, jurisdiction. There is the seal of God. Without it, the law would be invalid. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So by acknowledging the Sabbath, we acknowledge the lawgiver's authority in our lives. Now this law was for all, also for the stranger, also the sons of the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, everyone that keepeth the Sabbath. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people, Isaiah 56, 6 and 7. So it's not a Jewish law, it's a universal law. Now notice what has to be done in terms of the commandments of God, which are authenticated by the seal of God, which is in the Sabbath commandment. And these words which I command you today, this is concerning the Ten Commandments, shall be in your heart, and you shall carefully teach them to your sons, and you shall... Bind them for a sign upon your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Deuteronomy 6, 6 to 8. So God's law must be here and here. In other words, you have to act accordingly and be convinced accordingly. Now, some believe that you have to make a plaque 
with the commandments and place it there and place it there and then the deed is done. But I believe that God wants us to internalize this message and to think accordingly and act accordingly. And it shall be a sign unto thee upon thine hand and for a memorial between thine eyes that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. Exodus 13, 9. So God has a law, God has a seal, God has a distinguishing mark, a sign, which has to be in the mind and in our action. And by contrast, the mark of the beast has to be in the forehead or the hand. Because the system is happy if that conjunction is enforced and you act because you have to, or if you are convinced that it is right, either or. But God wants both. He wants it in the mind and the hand. Isaiah 8 verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal up the law among my disciples. And then it goes on in verse 18, Here am I and the children the Lord has given me. We are signs and symbols in Israel from the Lord Almighty who dwells in Mount Zion. So God's sign, God's symbol in the mind, in the hand, and in contrast, we have the mark of the beast. When men tell you to consult mediums and spiritists who whisper and mutter, should not a people inquire of their God? Why consult the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, they have no light of dawn. So we either obey God and his dictates, and we accept the Bible and the testimony, or we are in darkness. That is our choice. Can I change the word of God? Of course not. Can I change his law? Of course not. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman. So the dragon is wroth with the church and went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Now, what is the attribute of this remnant? who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So the testimony of Jesus, they cling to the word of God, but they also obey God's precepts and keep his commandments. Exodus 26, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. And John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the Lord says, here are my precepts, here is my law, keep it. If you love me, you will keep it. But there is a system that thinks that it can change times and laws, Daniel 7.25, and take this honor and this glory which belongs to God alone and apply it to itself. Well, is this legal? Is this biblical? Absolutely not. 2 Thessalonians 2.3, Let no man deceive you by any means. For that they shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So the man of sin would come and he would alter God's law. And that is sin is transgression of the law, how much more so altering God's law. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. 1 John 3 verse 4 says, Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. You cannot change and mess with God's law. It is immutable, it is unchangeable. And it is an affront to God to take that system and apply it and the authority that goes along with it to yourself. It is robbing God of that which is rightfully his. Now in Romans 3.20 we read, Therefore by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. I just want us to understand this. Nobody is saved because they keep the commandments of God in order to be saved. We are saved by grace. But the law tells us what sin is. Romans 3.31 Do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid, yea, we establish the law. So the law is not removed because we are under grace and because we accept salvation by faith. 
Romans 2 verse 12 says, For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So if I know about the law and I do it not, I will be judged. But if I don't know about God's law and I'm by habit a transgressor of the law, I am also guilty. James 2 verse 12, So speak ye and so do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So God's law is a law of liberty. It sets us free. Imagine how free the world would be if everybody kept God's law. There would be no keys because there would be no theft. There would be no murder. We could walk down any street. It would be a wonderful society. But the law will be the standard of judgment. Satan hates God's law and will tamper with it at every opportunity. Think not that I have come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Matthew 5, 17 and 18. God's law stands, it is immutable. It's in the Old Testament. We've seen it in the New Testament. I'll just briefly go through all the commandments. All ten of them we find in the New Testament. In Matthew, John, Timothy, Mark, Hebrews, Ephesians, Romans, James, etc. All of them are there in the New Testament. There is no, no injunction to remove the law in the New Testament era. Now, the man of sin takes the law of God and assumes the power of changing the law of God. That is the definition of sin. To transgress God's law, how much more so to change it? The Roman Decretalia state, he can pronounce sentences and judgments in contradictions to the rights of nations, to the law of God and man. He can free himself from the commands of the apostles, he being their superior, and from the rules of the Old Testament. The Pope has power to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Now these statements that come out of the papal system show that they take to themselves the power to change the precepts of God. In other words, they are directly opposing the authority of God and applying it to themselves. But Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8, so he does not change. I am the Lord, I change not. So how can we, as mere mortals, change his commandments? So what specifically is the mark of the beast? The mark of the beast must be the sign of the Roman church's authority. And what is the sign of its authority? People today say the mark of the beast is some code that will be placed upon the hand, a bank code. Is God interested in your banking transactions? Or is God interested in your allegiance and faithfulness to him? I'm not saying that some system like that might not be implemented to police the buying and selling issue, but the mark of the beast can only be defined by the beast itself. And the beast, according to the prophecy, is the papal system. So they will have to tell us what their mark is. And they do, in no uncertain terms. Uh, Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons, Thomas, writes in an answer to a letter, Of course the Catholic Church claims that the change, Sabbath to Sunday, was her act. And the act is a mark of her ecclesiastical power and authority in religious matters. This comes from the Catholic record. Sunday is our mark of authority. The church is above the Bible and this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. You see, the issue is not so much the day. The day is incidental. The issue is the authority that goes along with it. Is it the seal or the authority along with it that authenticates a law? Of course it is the authority that goes along with it. So 
the Sabbath gives authority to God's law and tells us that we have to keep it because he is the creator of the universe and he is the king and lawgiver. So when you touch the Sabbath, you touch the authority of God. Which is the Sabbath day? Saturday is the Sabbath day. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday, the convert's catechism of Catholic doctrine. They know exactly what they have done. Sunday is a Catholic institution and its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of Scripture, there is not a single passage which warrants the transfer of the weekly's public worship from the last day of the week to the first. Catholic Press, Sydney, August 25, 1900. They know. This is not ignorance. This is with absolute knowledge. Not the creator of the universe in Genesis 2, 1 to 3, but the Catholic Church can claim the honor of having granted man a pause to his work every seven days. Another Roman Catholic source. Reason and common sense demand the acceptance of one or the other of these alternatives. Either Protestantism and keeping holy of Saturday or Catholicity and the keeping holy of Sunday. Compromise is impossible. So in other words, the world will be brought to a point where they will have to choose between the authority of God and keeping the Sabbath or the authority of the church and keeping the Sunday. Nobody now has the mark of the beast until this is implemented by law. Sunday is founded not on scripture but on tradition and is distinctly a Catholic institution, Catholic record. The New Testament makes no explicit mention that the apostles changed the day of worship, but we know it from tradition. The new revised Baltimore Catechism of 1949. So tradition now becomes the lens through which doctrine is determined and not the word of God. But the Bible says that that is invalid. But he answered and said to them, why do you also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? And you voided the commandment of God by your tradition? But in vain they worship me teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. In 2003 on ImmaculateHeart.com, Rome reissued its challenge. Most Christians assume that Sunday is the biblically approved day of worship. The Roman Catholic Church protests that it transferred Christian worship from the biblical Sabbath Saturday to Sunday. And that to try to argue that the change was made in the Bible is both dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. If Protestantism wants to base its teachings only on the Bible, it should worship on Saturday. So Rome is throwing out the gauntlet and saying, whose authority do you accept? The authority of the Bible or the authority of the church? Compromise is impossible and to try and argue it from the scripture that Sunday is the right day is dishonest and a denial of Catholic authority. That's pretty straight. So I have to make a choice here. I have to make a choice. But please note that Romans chapter 6 verse 16 tells us, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, he servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness? So in other words, if I obey the dictates of the church contrary to the Bible, then I'm worshipping the beast. If I obey the biblical injunction, injunction, I am worshiping God. So the choice is mine. Now the Bible says that this mark of the beast, who they themselves have now determined that it is their mark of ecclesiastical power that they've transferred the Sabbath to Sunday, that this mark will become universal law and that the implementing power behind the scenes will be the United States of America. Is this possible given the Constitution of the United States? Are there moves in that direction? We will have to determine this from the history and from the circumstances which are now active in that nation. 
And may the Lord grant us wisdom as we ponder these things. We will continue in a while. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Will Protestant America implement the mark of the beast? This is the question we have to ask ourselves. Has Protestantism changed to such an extent that its separation from Rome, which it identified as the Antichrist in the past, has so changed that it now seeks an affiliation with Rome? Is this possible? Will the Constitution of the United States allow such an act? Well, in the history of the United States, we have had such an attempt before. There was an occasion when they wanted to introduce Sunday legislation, but this was blocked. However, regarding another issue where there was uh, a forum, an economic forum, the Supreme Court of the United States at one stage did implement restrictions regarding the Sunday. The Seventh-day Adventist Church at that time protested and the Roman Catholic Church took up this protest and published an editorial in the Catholic Mirror which was the official mouthpiece of the Roman Catholic Cardinal in the United States. February 24, 1893, the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists adopted certain resolutions appealing to the government and people of the United States from the decision of the Supreme Court declaring this to be a Christian nation and from the action of Congress in legislating upon the subject of religion. It is not that the Adventist Church here was against Christianity, but against the legislation of certain norms and dogmas which were not necessarily biblical, but rather based on tradition. Now, this is what the Roman Catholic Church wrote of its own accord. In March 1893, the International Religious Liberty Association printed these resolutions in a tract entitled Appeal and Remonstrance, on receipt of one of these, the editor of the Catholic Mirror of Baltimore, Maryland, published a series of four editorials which appeared in that paper, September 2, 9, 16, and 23 in 1893. So this was an interesting historic document. Now, it is interesting that this issue of Sabbath Sunday was also an issue at the beginning of Protestantism. It's almost <laughs> like two temple cleansings, we can almost say. The editor says it was upon this very point, the Sabbath Sunday issue, that the Reformation in its entirety was condemned by the Council of Trent. The Reformers had constantly charged, as he has stated, that the Catholic Church had apostatized from the truth as contained in the written word, the written word, the Bible, the Bible only, thus says the Lord, 
These were their constant watchwords. Now, what gave the Roman Catholic Church to condemn Protestantism over here? The Bible and the Bible alone was the view of the Reformation and the platform of the Reformation and Protestantism. And this argument was held at the Council of Trent and it is fascinating. The scripture and tradition, of course, this was the position of Rome. The Bible as interpreted by the church and according to the unanimous consent of the fathers, this was the position and the claim of the Catholic Church. This was the main issue in the Council of Trent. And this council was called to discuss the problems that the reformers had with the Roman Catholic system. Well, they couldn't find an accord on this issue of the Bible alone or Bible and tradition and then they continued to write finally after a long and intensive mental strain the Archbishop of Reggio came into the council with substantially the following argument to the party who held for scripture alone quote the Protestants claim to stand upon the written word only. They profess to hold the scripture alone as the standard of faith. They justify their revolt by the plea that the church has apostatized from the written word and follows tradition. Now the Protestant claim that they stand upon the written word only is not true. Their profession of holding the scripture alone as the standard of faith is false proof. The written word explicitly enjoins the observance of the seventh day as the Sabbath. They do not observe the seventh day, but reject it. If they do truly hold to the scripture alone as their standard, they would be observing the seventh day as enjoined in the scripture throughout. Yet they not only reject the observance of the Sabbath enjoined in the written word, but they have adopted and do practice the observance of Sunday, for which they have only the tradition of the church. Consequently, the claim of Scripture alone as the standard fails and the doctrine of Scripture and tradition as essential is fully established, the Protestants themselves being judges. Well, they boast that uh, there was no getting around this. For the Protestants' own statement of faith, the Augsburg Confession of 1530 had clearly admitted that the observance of the Lord's Day had been appointed by the Church only. So the Archbishop of Reggio made this speech at the last opening of the session of Trent on the 18th of January, 1562. And in actual fact, Protestantism had a golden opportunity to stand for the scripture and the scripture alone. And they failed. Are they going to fail again? Or is someone going to stand up and say, thus says the Lord? This was the inconsistency of the Protestant practice with the Protestant profession that gave the Catholic Church her long-sought and anxiously desired ground upon which to condemn Protestantism and the whole Reformation movement as only a selfishly ambitious rebellion against church authority. Now notice that they say, and this is the vital controversy, the key, the chiefest, the culminist expression of the Protestant inconsistency, was in the rejection of the Sabbath of the Lord, the seventh day enjoined in the scripture and the adoption and observance of Sundays enjoined by the Catholic Church. So they say, you are accepting our authority. And they claim that this is the vital issue upon which the Catholic Church arraigns Protestantism. What will these Protestants do? Now the Bible says that Protestant America will implement the mark of the beast, and all the world wandered after the beast. Revelation 13.3 Now, is Rome pushing for Sunday legislation, and will America enforce and follow suit? That is the question we have to ask. Now, we can only look at the change of circumstance and environment and political and religious atmosphere that prevails in the world today and we can draw our conclusions from reading between the lines. Pope John Paul II launched the crusade to save Sunday and put it back onto the agenda. This comes from the Sunday Times London in 1998. It says down there, make it clear that Sunday must not be worked since it must be celebrated as our Lord's Day. 
He wrote an apostolic letter, and in it he expounded as to why we have to keep Sunday. The apostolic letter, Dies Domini of the Holy Father, John Paul II, to the bishops, clergy, and faithful of the Catholic Church on keeping the Lord's Day holy. And this was May 7, 1998. Now, this just goes through some of the features of this document. He called Sunday the primordial feast day, revealing the meaning of time. He admits that it is based on tradition, and therefore not scripture. And he states that the Sunday celebration of the Lord's Day and his Eucharist is at the heart of the church's life. So the church, as its heart, has Sunday keeping. As they listened to the word proclaimed in the Sunday assembly, the faithful looked to the Virgin Mary, learning from her to keep it and ponder it. Now, my Bible tells me to look to the Lord Jesus Christ. So here we have a dichotomy, and I have to choose. Am I going to follow the stream of authority of the Roman church, or am I going to follow the authority of God? From Sunday to Sunday, the pilgrim people follow in the footsteps of Mary, and her maternal intercession gives special power and fervor to the prayer which rises from the church to the Most Holy Trinity. The Bible knows nothing about an intercession of Mary. It only knows of one mediator between man and God, the man Christ Jesus. And so, to me, as a Protestant, this would be totally invalid. The day of rest, he admits it is the day of the sun, his own inverted commas. It would therefore be wrong to see in this legislation of the rhythm of the week which the church applied in the past a mere historical circumstance with no special significance for the church in which he could simply set aside. Even after the fall of the empire, the councils did not cease to insist upon the arrangements regarding Sunday rest. So is he applying for some pressure to implement Sunday again? When through the centuries she had made laws concerning Sunday rest, she had the workers in mind. This is interesting. So we can bring in Sunday legislation even in non-Sunday keeping countries by bringing it in through the door of the workers' plight. A day of rest, a family day. It doesn't matter in which form it comes, if it becomes a legal obligation and it requires the negating or the leaving aside of the biblical Sabbath, then I have to choose between the mark of the beast and the mark of God. Therefore, also in the particular circumstances of our time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. So he's asking Christians, Christian nations, therefore, to implement legislation to observe Sunday. It is interesting that at the same time period, they also brought out a document concerning church laws where certain norms were inserted into the code of canon laws. This document was called Ad Tuendum Fidem. And in this document, he calls those that differ with the church and do not want to listen to the doctrinal position of the church as heretics, something that the church hasn't done for a long time. We read that Canon 1436, one must now read, whoever denies and places in doubt any truth that must be believed with divine and Catholic faith or repudiates the Christian faith as a whole and does not come to his senses after having been legitimately warned is to be punished as a heretic. Now that's fascinating. Fascinating. Aside from such cases, whoever rejects a doctrine proposed as definitively to be held and they just defined that Sunday was the heart of the church's teaching by the Roman pontiff or the college bishop exercises their authentic magisterium or else accepts a doctrine condemned by them as erroneous and does not come to his senses after having been legitimately warned is to be punished by an appropriate penalty. This is fascinating. So we have heresy and punishment. It seems we are moving back into the middle age Milieu. We order that everything decreed by us with a capital letter in this apostolic letter be firm and instated, given 
in the 20th year of our pontificate. Here is a power that is assuming a power which is not biblical, given by us in our pontifical. God said, let us make man in our image. They're taking the same authority and the same power and applying it to themselves. Now, could they be perhaps a little bit more specific and say, which part is the heretic part really associated with? Well, the Detroit News reported on July 7, 1998, that Pope John Paul II said, A person who violates the sanctity of Sunday is to be punished as a heretic. So here the Roman Catholic Church asks for this issue to be prominent in the minds of men. In April 24, 2005, interviewed on NBC's Meet the Press, Jesuit priest and Ignatius Press founder Joseph Fessio said, those who rebel against the church's authentic teachings are rebelling against God. Here we have this issue of another power on earth claiming the authority of God, changing God's law, and enforcing it upon mankind. Now the present Pope, does he continue with this trend? Well, on Sunday Mass, Catholic Online reported that he claimed we can't live without it, he tells the crowd at Angelus. Sunday Mass is not an imposition but a joy and a need for Catholics, said Benedict. In Bari, he defined Sunday as a necessary instrument to leave the desert of frenetic consumerism, religious indifference and secularism which is close to transcendence. These are issues that are true, but this doesn't make it God's law. We cannot live without Sunday was the theme of the Congress. Now the Bible says that the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast before him and causes the earth and those dwelling in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Revelation 13, 12. Now if we look at this political climate in the United States today, is it at this point conducive again for implementing such a move? Well, we will have to read between the lines and sometimes in the lines as to what the mood is. In the New World Order document written by Pat Robertson, it says there on page 236, the next obligation that a citizen of God's world order owes is to himself. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy is a command for the personal benefit of each citizen. Higher civilizations rise when people can rest and draw inspiration from God. Laws in America that mandated a day of rest, Sunday laws, have been nullified as a violation of the separation of church and state, as an outright insult to God and his plan. Only those policies that can be shown to have a clearly secular purpose are recognized. So he says it is an insult to God if we don't have this form of legislation. But the Sabbath, of course, is not the seventh day Sabbath that they are referring to, but the first day Sabbath. Time magazine, August 2, 2004. On the seventh day we rested, but please note that the seventh day there is the Sunday and not the Saturday. So when they talk about the Sabbath, they're not talking about Saturday, they're talking about Sunday. In that article, on August 2, 2004, uh, Nancy Gibbs writes, If your soul has no Sunday, it becomes an orphan, Albert Schweitzer said, which raises a question for these times. What is lost if Sunday becomes just like an, any other day? With progress, of course, comes backlash from those who desperately want to preserve the old ways. Time to worship. Spend time with the family, friends, or just plain rest from work week made sense then, still makes sense now. So the arguments here are based on family, based on workers' rights. Whatever the issue, whatever the side door by which these legislations can creep in is incidental. If they are implemented to the detriment of the Sabbath of God, then we have to make a choice. And I believe that the world is heading towards that choice. 
She writes, Pope John Paul II even wrote an apostolic letter in defense of Sunday. Quote, when Sunday loses its fundamental meaning and becomes merely a part of the weekend, he wrote, people stay locked within a horizon so limited that they can no longer see the heavens. If we look at the political climate of Protestantism in general in the United States and its affiliation and uh, liaison with Rome, is the climate conducive to talk about these issues? I'm not saying that any of these individuals are on the point of introducing such legislation. I'm merely looking at the climate. So let's look at one of the most prominent leaders in the Protestant world, Dr. James Dobson. How does he feel about Roman Catholic affiliations and their views on family, rest, and all of these issues? Well, the US News and World Report reported in January 17, 2005, that leaders of this statue would probably fill the void that Billy Graham, in his retirement, left behind. ChristianityToday.com uh, reports that uh, James Dobson met with the Pope, together with Charles Colson, and they discussed at this conference at the Vatican last week on the global economy's impact on the families, and during the conference, the two Protestants met with the Pope. So, they might not agree with the papacy, but there are issues of contact. Dobson later told Catholic News Service that though he had theological differences with Roman Catholicism, when it comes to the family, there is far more agreement than disagreement, and with regard to moral issues from abortion to premarital sex, safe sex ideology, and homosexuality, I find more in common with Catholics than with some of my evangelical brothers and sisters. I'm not talking about these individuals and their individual acts. I'm talking about a climate of liaison that exists in the United States at the moment. There is this affiliation, even though there might still be doctrinal differences, when it comes to the issues of morality, when it comes to the issues of the family, then of course they are in agreement. And Rome has a very important agenda when it comes to this issue of family and wishes to implement Sunday legislation using that as a pretext. U.S. News and World Report, May 2, 2005, columnist Michael Barone said, if you read the headlines, you run the risk of thinking we are headed towards a theocracy. So the climate in the United States is definitely conducive to religious legislation. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Revelation 13, 15, would they go that far? And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the number of the beast or the number of this name. So will he be implemented? Well, the image is something that looks like the original. Did the first beast have Sunday legislation? Yes, they had. And did they enforce it? And did they counter Sabbath keeping? Yes, they did. The Senate of Toulouse in A.D. 1163 wrote a decree against the Valdensias who kept the Sabbath. The bishops and priests take care and to forbid under pain of excommunication every person from presuming to give reception or at least assistance to the following of this heresy, which was Sabbath keeping, which first began in the country of Tulu, whenever they shall be discovered, neither were they to have any dealings with them in buying or selling, that being so deprived of the common assistance of life, they might be compelled to repent of the evil of their way. Whoever shall dare to contravene this order, let them be excommunicated as a partner with them in guilt. And as many of them as can be found, let them be imprisoned by the Catholic princes and punished with the forfeiture of all their substance. Well, King Idolfonsus banished the Valdensias, and after that they went in, and they executed many of them. The death sentence went into effect. So the beast had such legislation. The image would do the same according to the scripture. There was a previous attempt by the Supreme Court to implement some form of Sabbath Sunday restriction. Now the present Supreme Court, this is what it looked like. 
Two of these individuals have retired so far. Justice Day O'Connor and Rehnquist has uh, died in his place. We have John Roberts, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who is described as a conservative Roman Catholic. We have President Bush introducing Samuel Alita, who is also described as a serious Roman Catholic. And so the Supreme Court today is largely Catholic versus Protestant. So if there were a vote, would they possibly vote along with Catholic intentions? We find the President of the United States attending the Red Mass together with many of his dignitaries, so there is an affiliation between the Supreme Court and the activities of the Roman Catholic Church surrounding it. So the climate is indeed conducive to such a change. And then there is the movement in the United States for a Ten Commandments Day every first Sunday in May, where they want to reinstate the moral values of the Decalogue. Now, this is the climate that I'm sketching. I'm not referring to any particular individual pushing this particular agenda. But the climate is inducive for such a change. Under John Paul II, who helped bring down the Iron Curtain, the Holy See gained more political clout than it had enjoyed since the Renaissance. The Pope was the only one to be a world evangelist. He could visit all faiths, Islam and Judaism. He prepared the way for a religious new world order. BBC, 2nd of April, 2005. This religious new world order, will it implement Sunday keeping on the pretext that the workers and the families need more time together? And will it also at the same time prevent, like the previous councils of Rome did, the keeping of the Sabbath. I believe that the time is ready for that. The present Pope has the same stature. Here we have all the religious leaders of the world congratulating him as he comes into the fold. John 14, 6, Jesus says unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. There's only one way, and that is the way of Jesus. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose ye this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So if this issue comes to the point, and I believe according to the scripture that it will, I will have to stand by what God says. And by the grace of God, I will receive the power from on high, to stand for what is right. The Sabbath of the Lord, and thus saith the Lord, rather than the dictates of men.